at why Christmas in the words of Jesus himself. Jesus himself says this. He says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Christmas is about God sending his Son into the world to seek and to save what was lost. So I'm going to start out by talking about lostness. I'm going to talk a little bit about lostness, all right? The first thing I want to notice about lostness is this. No one tries to get lost. Did anybody today say, you know what? This morning when I get up, head, head out to church, I'm going to see if I can get lost on the way. No, no one, no one does that. Tries to, tries to get lost. Somehow we just managed to do that. Oh, you didn't try to get lost today? <laughs> okay. There are some times when we wish we could kind of get lost from the company at my house, or the boss, or, you know, yeah, I understand that. But no one intentionally tries to get lost. We don't. Second principle I find here is it's very easy to get lost. You ever notice that? Yeah, you, you didn't try to do it. It's really easy to get lost. You, you, you don't have to try to get lost. But you find yourself often, all of a sudden you just don't know where you're at. Now, I have a pretty good sense of direction, but every now and then, we'll be in a strange place, and it'll be a foggy day. That's a killer. That's a killer. Because I can't tell where the sun is at. And if it's a foggy day, I'm not forced, I can't tell what side of, of the tree the moss is on. And, uh, but it's easy to get lost in certain circumstances. Right? Next thing I know about it, you can be lost and not even know it. Have you ever noticed that? You can be lost and not even know it. I can remember uh, when we were growing up, uh, there was this guy that worked with my dad. His name was Ted. My dad always had these stories of what Ted said at work. And Ted said he had a shorter way to get to uh, Missouri, where our family was. Uh, when we went on vacation, we would obviously have grandparents. And so he was taking Ted's advice. And so we got into our tradition. You get up really early in the morning, and we pack us all in so that the kids would sleep. There were five of us. And we would sleep uh, on the way while we were traveling. And he had these new directions, and uh, he was traveling and traveling and traveling. And we've been driving for hours. It's now daylight, and we've been driving for hours. And uh, we notice on the sign coming up, it says, Welcome to Michigan. <laughs> See, you can be lost and not even know it. You would think, I mean, this is the back before GTS, right? And so you can be lost and not even know it. Most people in this world spiritually are lost and they don't even know it. They didn't try to get lost. They were born that way. We've all been, we were born lost. We didn't know which way we were going. So it was really easy to get lost because our parents did it to us. Right? And we're lost. Most people are lost spiritually and they don't even know it. The next thing is you can be lost and it doesn't mean that you're stupid. Did you know that intelligent people can get lost? <laughs> I'll bet Albert Einstein at some point was lost. Right? Brilliant man. It has nothing to do with how smart you are or how stupid you are. It's just we get lost. We lose our way. The fifth thing. It's really hard to convince someone that they are lost sometimes. Alright? Maybe you've never noticed that. The person who thought I the other day was certain I was going the right way. Because I have such a good sense of direction. And uh, my wife said, I think it's the other direction. <laughs> now what does she know? I got the sense of I got the sense of direction. And, and so, there we are, we're driving along, and, and she said, but I think, and sure enough, she brought up on GPS, she said, I think you need to turn around. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I, it, it's hard to convince some people that they are lost because they are convinced that they are not. That's why sharing our faith with people who are lost is so difficult. They don't believe that they are lost. And so when we try to share with them, they think we're crazy, we're lost, we, but we're the ones who've been found, and they're the ones that are lost, but they don't want to hear anything of it. I think. So they're very hard to convince that they are lost. 
The next one is that in Omaha, big loss can be fun. Ask any kid. You're shopping, they meander away, they're in the toy department. Are they having fun? Over the speaker goes a lost child, or, you know, the parents are looking for a lost child, and the kid is oblivious. Man, he's got some little machine gun thing, he's figuring out how to make noise, he's got a doll, he's got all these parts and attachments they go through and try to put together, and they're just playing, they're totally oblivious, because being lost can be fun. In fact, the person who is without Christ and is lost feels like they are having the fun and we have no fun. I would argue just the opposite. We are the ones who truly have fun, and they are the ones that don't have the fun. They have to have artificial stimuli in order to achieve the fun that we have in Christ. We have something beyond fun. We have something beyond happiness. We have a thing called joy. 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 Because joy is not dependent upon any circumstances, whereas happiness is dependent upon the whatever happens. Okay? And fun it is when we have things happen in such a way they give us a thrill. But for the Christian, being saved and knowing that you've been found by Jesus brings you joy no matter what goes on. At the same time, being lost can also be dangerous. It can be dangerous. You can find yourself driving down the road and find out that the bridge is out ahead. That'd be a little bit dangerous. Oh, I'm lost. This is obviously not, not the road I'm supposed to be on. And so lostness it can be fun and it can be dangerous. Loss can also, one of the things about lostness is admitting you are lost is the first step to actually being found. When he says, oh, you know, I'm not sure I know where I'm at. A young kid comes up to me and says, hey, pastor. He said, you know why uh, <clears throat> Moses wandered in the wilderness for 40 years? Well, I know the answer to that. But I want to hear the answer from the child. I said, okay. No, why was Moses lost for 40, or wandered in the wilderness for 40 years? And he says, because he wouldn't stop and ask for directions. <laughs> A typical male. <laughs> Admitting that you are lost is the first step to being found. It's a really important point. Because at some point, even spiritually, you've got to come to the point and say, I'm lost. I, I, don't, I don't know my way through life. I'm lost. I don't have the path of forgiveness. I'm lost. I don't have a Savior. I'm lost. And it's that admitting that you're lost that is the first step to being found. And that's what Jesus said. He came into the world to seek and to save the lost. I want to talk about seeking for just a moment. Seeking can be time consuming. It can be time consuming. I don't know about you, but sometimes you lose something. Uh, my wife is famous for losing a gadget. It's called the phone. <laughs> she, if she tells me what she tells me a dozen times a day. Uh, please, would you please call my phone so I can find it, right? Because if I don't call it, it could be really time-consuming. Hunting everywhere, because she never leaves at the same place. It's always somewhere else. And it can become very time-consuming hunting for it. And sometimes that's really inconvenient. This morning when I got up <clears throat> to uh, come to church, I uh, got myself ready as I normally do. And then I, I was on my way out the door, reached my pocket to get my keys, and my keys were not there. Now, I'm on a time crunch now. i got to get to church. But my keys were not there. So it's not only time-consuming, but it's inconvenient. I have to think and go to all the stations where I possibly could have lost them. I never lose my keys. I mean, they're always in my pocket. I, I, I have a system where I'm always in. I put them in the wrong pocket. I put them in my coat pocket. But after searching, I finally trace back what coat was I wearing when I went out snow globe last thing that I did again yesterday, and they were in the coat pocket. And, and so it can be very time consuming. Jesus, for Jesus it was time consuming too. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, when Jesus started his ministry, 
his mother said, hey, Jesus, they're out, uh, out of wine. And Jesus says to his mother, because she's wanting him to perform a miracle and provide the wine for the, the wedding feast. And Jesus says, my hour is not yet come. Modern translations have it, my time is not yet come. It wasn't time yet. And then if you follow through the, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, my time is not yet come. Chapter 7, my time is not yet come. Chapter 8, my time is not yet come. You go all the way through. Later, in John, John chapter 12, he says, the hour or the time has come. And he says that several times in John 12, and then also in chapter 13, Jesus knew that he was on a mission to seek and to save the lost. But he knew that it was time-consuming, and it wasn't the right time, but when the right time arrived, he was going to do what it would take to find us. And that was to go to the cross. Voluntary laid himself down on the cross as a substitute, taking our place. He would be lifted up between heaven and earth, and there he would die as a sacrifice for our sins. So that our sin was imputed to him, it was charged in his account. And when we believe in Him, His righteousness is charged to our account. We're found. We're found. We're found. You see, another thing about seeking, it can be unappreciated. You, you know, when, you, when you've done the search and you find it, you give it to the person, maybe somebody is at the store, they're looking, they've lost some money, and, and uh, you, you, you still have to found it in the parking lot, you bring it to them, you give it to them, and they don't even give you a thank you. <gasps> Grab it. They run. Could be unappreciated, can yeah. yeah. I'm suggesting that when Jesus, in his life ministry, he came on a mission to seek. He was searching, seeking, finding. He's finding us. And they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And we have no king but Caesar, they cried back. What Jesus did was so unappreciated. Your seeking can be unappreciated. Seeking can be hard and dangerous. Think about it. I should have put like 9-11, the towers there. The, the firemen rushing in, seeking to rescue the people who are on the inside was very hard and it was very dangerous. Seeking us for Christ was very hard and very dangerous. It cost him his life. Seeking can also lead to finding other idols. Now, when I was hunting for my keys, all right, there was a good chance, as this often happens, I find something else that was missing. Like you could be hunting for your keys at all. I forgot about that money I slipped inside the pocket of the, that pair of jeans. And, oh, I didn't even realize that was lost. But I found something that I wasn't even looking for. It leads to finding other lost items. In fact, that's what the gospel says. Jesus said he came to the lost house of, of Israel. Those were sheep. But then later he says, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them in also. I, I've come to find them, and I, I, I'm seeking, and I'm finding. And, and when he, he's not just finding the Jews, though salvation is of the Jews, he's finding. He said he came unto his own, his own received him not. But whoever receives him, he gives the power, the authority to become the children of God. And so he says, I have other sheep, other sheep. He finds other people, finds us. Still in Jesus' own words, Jesus says, that, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save, to save what was lost. I'm not talking about saving for a moment. Here the idea of saving is not that I'm putting money in the bank. Okay? The idea uh, of saving here is I'm rescuing. Uh, years ago, uh, we were on vacation and, and uh, the little girls were on a diving board about ready to jump in. First one jumped in, second one jumped in, they swam out of third one. Went up to the edge of the diving board, stopped, Nah, I'm not going to go in. Turn around. So my, they really take my interest. I'm watching. My, my boys are still young and they're waiting in line. And then she goes up to the edge. She's ready to go. She doesn't go. She backs off. She turns around and goes back. Third time I said, Will she do it or is she going to be a coward? 
find the sheep and show them sin. And the next day goes to park to the big screen. She doesn't come up. She doesn't come up. Finally, the little hand breaks the water. It goes back down. I think, this girl is in trouble. Well, I jump out of my lounge chair and running across, I jump into the water, and that little hand came up. You know when the adrenaline's rushing, you can do some pretty incredible things. I grabbed that little hand, and with one jerk, she went clear over my head. <laughs> she was little. <laughs> she went clear over my head, and then I, I got into the floor, and, and my kids were saying, Dad's the hero, he's the savior. But I rescued her, and that's, I saved her life, okay, from drowning. I was her savior, rescuer. That's what it means here, saving. About saving. And Jesus gives us three parables about saving in uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. The first one, saving means rescuing from wandering away. He tells the story, a man had a hundred sheep, and one of his sheep wanders away. He's got the 99, but the one is lost. So he leaves all the 99 that are safe in the, in the fold, and he goes out searching for the one lost sheep so he can rescue that one lost sheep. And the text says, when he finds him, when the shepherd finds him, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, and he goes home, and then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Now, I don't know how that sheep got lost. Maybe it was just nibbling away, just nibbling away on the grass. The rest of them leave, and he's just nibbling away, not paying attention. He's just wandering away. And now, all of a sudden, he's lost. He doesn't know where he's at. The shepherd doesn't know where he's at. He's got to go out and find. And so the shepherd goes to search for the one that has nibbled his way away. Wandered away. For us, there's probably somebody here who says, you know what, I've kind of wandered away too. I'm kind of lost and have no direction in my life. Don't know exactly what my purpose is, where I'm going, what I'm doing. Things don't seem to be working how I planned. And I'm lost. And it's not that I deliberately went out to get lost, I just kind of wandered away. Little by little, and pretty soon I realized I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I'm lost. The text says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more excitement, more, more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, returns, comes back over the 99 righteous per persons who need no repentance. There's a lot of celebrating going on in heaven when wanderers come back. Isn't that great? Do you think there's a party here? A great party in heaven. The second story Jesus told was about a misplaced lostness. We can wander away lostness or we can have a misplaced lostness. A woman had ten coins and she lost one of them. In the first story there was a hundred and lost one. That's one out of a hundred. This is one out of ten. She searches everywhere. She sweeps the house. She lights a candle. She's in the lamp and she's looking around. She's trying to find that lost coin. And when she finally finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found that lost coin. In the same way, Jesus says, from that parable, here's the application. I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of God. Or in the presence of the angels of God. That's really important, the difference between that. It's not in the presence of God, that would be the angels are rejoicing. But it's in the presence of the angels of God, which means God is rejoicing. So the text is saying, I tell you, there's rejoicing on God's part over one sinner who repents, who turns around, changes his way, is found. That which is misplaced, some people feel misplaced, I just don't fit in anywhere. But when they're found, they have a place. We have a place in the body of Christ, which is called the church. We have a place. The third story he told, the first one they lost one out of a hundred, the second one they lost uh, one out of ten, and now it's one out of two. Fifty percent is lost. He tells a story about a man who had two sons, and the one son, which was the younger, told his father, hey, I want my inheritance now. Now, to say that in that culture would be to say, Dad, drop dead. I want what you got now. 
Right? So he, he gets his inheritance, the father gives him his inheritance, and he has calculated, ah, I got the money while I'm young, while I can enjoy it. Why would I want the money when I'm old when I can't enjoy it? You know what I'm saying? We've all thought about that sometimes. And why did I have uh, all the money to the vacations when I could enjoy them? And so he's going out, he's going to enjoy it. He goes out, he's enjoying life, and he spends all the money, and then a famine occurs, and the next thing you know, he has nothing. And, and he's actually a Jewish boy on a pig farm, taking care of pigs, which are unclean, and, and he finds that he's eating from the pig's food. And finally, he remembers. If I could just go home, my dad has plenty, he would take care of me. I'm going to go back and say, Father, I have sinned. Just treat me like a hired hand. Because at least then, I, I would get something to eat, wouldn't have to eat pig food. He had miscalculated and found himself lost. He had miscalculated, oh, I got all this money, in it, but it ran out. Sometimes we miscalculate in life. We miscalculate relationships. We miscalculate in, 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 in our finances. We miscalculate on our health. We, miscal we miscalculate. And we find ourselves in great need, as this man did. He goes back and he says, his father ran out to meet him. And he threw his arm in him. And he said, Father, I've said, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired hands. He says, no, no. He said, kill the fatted uh, uh, ram. He said, let, put, put a fine coat upon him, a robe on him, and put a ring on his finger. He said, this is my son who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now found. He was lost and now found. He was rescued from his miscalculation and there is a spiritual lostness that we need to be rescued from. He was lost and is now found. And I'm telling you all this because Jesus said this is the reason why he came. This is the real Christmas message because you see in Matthew chapter 1 when Joseph uh, was questioning uh, his bride-to-be was pregnant. An angel visited him because he was thinking about divorcing her. An angel came and said, no, no, take her to be your wife. Because what has happened to her has been by the Holy Spirit. And you're going to have a child. You're going to have a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus. Jesus. Comes from two parts. Two parts. Jesus goes from the Old Testament. Joshua. Joshua. And it means Jehovah saves. Did we sing that at the very beginning? There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. Why? Because Jehovah saves. Jesus is Jehovah who saves. He will save his people from their sins. Jesus knew from the very birth by his very name. And the name in the Semitic concept means more than just a title. It had to do with who you are and what you do. And his name tells us that. Jesus is Jehovah. That's who he is. He is God come in the flesh. The part, the second part of the name is saves. That's what he does. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, he's come to save us from our past losses. When I was eight years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my heart. It was just a childlike prayer. And Jesus saved me from all my past sin. I was lost of all, because of all these sins, I was lost away from God. He saved me from my past lostness. Every day when I trust in Jesus and temptation comes into my life, and, and would, that would tempt me to wander away or to be misplaced and all of those things, when I exercise my faith in Him, He saves me from present lostness. And the truth is, one day He's coming, He's going to return. And He's going to save me from ever being lost again. I will ever be with the Lord forever. Now, in the context of what we're reading here, this, this verse, the context, is that Jesus is on His way from Jericho. And, and there's a man there, he's, he's the chief tax collector. And the chief tax collector is like the most hated man in Jericho. Because he is a guy who works for the Roman government collecting taxes. And suppose your tax was 10%, he charges you 
and he keeps the five and pays the Roman government the ten. He's a Jew, taken from the Jews, and he's given to the Romans. The Jews hate this guy. He is the most hated man probably in, in Jericho. Not only is he hated, he's, he, he's this tax collector, but he's a wealthy man. So all the other people know that they've gotten, that he's gotten his wealth on their backs. He's a hated man. The other thing about him, he's a short man. He came and he, he wanted to go see Jesus. And because he's short, he knew that no one in that crowd was going to part the way for him. And they hated him. And so he has to run ahead of the crowd. And because he's short, he knows the crowd's moving along with him. They're just going to push him out of the way. He climbs up in a sycamore tree. How many remember the song, huh? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. And we learned that as a child in Sunday school. Zacchaeus, he says, come down immediately. I must stay at your home. I find this my God. Jesus called him by name. I don't know, maybe today, in this message, you know that Jesus is calling you by name. He says, come down. In the book of Revelation, it says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And he's knocking on your heart's door. And he's speaking to you, saying, I want to come into your life so that you can be found and I can show you the way so you don't have to be lost anymore. Zacchaeus responded appropriately. He came down at once, immediately. Boom, I'm there. And welcomed him gladly. <coughs> All the people saw this. Oh, they began to mutter. Can you imagine? most hated guy in Jericho and Jesus is cozying up to him. One of the most wealthy guys in Jericho and Jesus is cozying. Can you not imagine the muttering? Why is he hanging out with the sinner and this wealthy guy? What is this? Is he trying to get some political points here? What, what's going on? You can just imagine the crowd. He said he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Why, why, why Christmas? I'm asked this question, why Christmas? The very next verse is this. Today, salvation has come to this house. Jesus, the Savior, entered the home. Salvation is there. It's for the taking. He's there. Salvation is coming to Now watch what it says. The very next verse is this. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus' favorite term for himself, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that was, which was lost. Zacchaeus was really lost. He, he, he was on the wrong path. His, his life was a mess. And that day, Zacchaeus was found. Let me sum this up. Why did God enter into your world, this world? Why did God enter into our world? To seek you out, that he might save you from your lostness and all its consequences. Listen, he is still seeking you today to save you. You see, you can be found, and you can be found today. All you have to do is pray. Let's bow our heads. Perhaps somebody here has uh, been down a wayward path. You've wandered away. Maybe you feel a little misplaced. You didn't intend to get there, but you just happened to be there. And uh, you know that you're a little lost. You can't get in the fog. And you need God to lift the fog and and you need to just come back to him. As I said, just repent. Go back to him. Return, return and go back to him. Like the prodigal son saying, I'm going home. I'm going back to my father. If that's where you're at today, you just pray this. Father in heaven, I'm lost. I can't find my way. 
I'm accepting Jesus as my Savior to find me and show me the way. Lord, we know that if anyone prays anything close to that, with faith in their heart, that they will be saved. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, but with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, they'll be rescued, they'll be found. They won't be lost. I pray, Lord, that today will be the day of salvation to the person who prays and says, find me, Jesus. For I pray this in Jesus' name. And the Apostle Peter said, there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the only way. If you're on any other path, you're lost. But if you're on that path of faith in Jesus, you've been found. And he'll make the path clear for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray. As a people who place faith in Jesus, we believe in God the Father, we believe in God the Son, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe that he was born of the Virgin Mary. We believe that he vicariously died on the cross for our sins. We believe that he rose from the dead, proving that he paid in full the price of our sin. That has, he has eternal life to give to us. We believe one day he's coming again to receive us. Lord, we believe that he came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. We don't have to be lost anymore. We can be found simply by believing.